and the Hannibal LaGrange University. saying such nice things about me. I never know if I'm ever going to get used to that. I want to thank Senator Laughlin for being here. Senator Laughlin is a leader in the conservative movement in the state of Missouri, a true hero of that movement, a leader in our General Assembly, and it takes people with courage like her to stand up and do the right things for the right reasons so that we can enjoy freedom, safety, and prosperity. So I'm eternally grateful for her friendship and for her leadership in Jefferson City. Nothing would get done if we didn't have a, a hero like her at the helm there in the state senate. So we should all be grateful. I'm personally grateful for her friendship and leadership. Uh, it's a privilege to get to be here with you today. Uh, so you, you heard a little bit about my background. I care about freedom. I care about safety. I care about prosperity. And those are principles that I know uh, the student body here at Hannibal LaGrange cares about, and that certainly the administration does. Um, so I grew up in Columbia. Uh, in 1999, uh, I was going to go to, I wanted to enlist in the military. My mom wanted me to go to college, and somewhere in between there, we figured out that you, the Army could pay for college, and so I did Army ROTC at the University of Missouri, and uh, the plan was always to go to law school. 9-11 happened, those plans changed, uh, and I, I remember as I was about to graduate, the Army said, well, what do you want to do in the Army? I said, well, tanks, infantry, engineer, field artillery, like what, you know, what can I do that I get to, to shoot weapons, basically. Like any, any job that involves pulling a trigger is probably something I'm interested in. And so I ended up in Armor Branch. So I was trained on the M1 Abrams main battle tank at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And do we have any hunters in the room? Anybody, avid shooters, hunters? Yeah, okay. So people that enjoy our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. There is nothing cooler than shooting the 120 millimeter main gun on that Abrams tank. I'm telling you, it is, it is pretty cool. So I got to do that. Uh, graduated tank school, reported to my first duty station. I was assigned to the last heavy armored cavalry regiment in the Army. Uh, my regimental commander was H.R. McMaster. He went on to be President Trump's national security advisor. But at the time, he was a, a, a full bird colonel in the Army. And we deployed to Iraq. And some, at the time, it was all male. It was, only males could serve in combat arms branches. And I was assigned as a scout platoon leader. So I had six Bradley fighting vehicles, 30 soldiers, and usually two platoons of Iraqis. We lived in, on a small base, just 180 American soldiers, all male living in tents up in the Nineveh province, Iraq. You'll remember the Nineveh province from your, your study of the Bible. Uh, so Nineveh province, Iraq, 2005, it gets hot living in those tents. Uh, there's no running water or, you know, a, a flushing toilets. And, man, I tell you, when you're wearing 60 pounds of uh, full body armor plus 210 rounds of ammunition and patrolling city streets uh, and you can only shower once a week, I, I tell you, you look forward to that shower because you're sweating a lot out there in the 115 degree heat. But leading soldiers in combat was a, a privilege and it taught me a lot about leadership and management and those are skills I bring with me to the Missouri Attorney General's office. We got to secure a small town in northwestern Iraq in the Nineveh province for their constitutional referendum. The first time hundreds of Iraqis had ever voted because under Saddam's dictatorship they didn't have the freedom to make their own political decisions. And so getting to secure that town and see men and women vote for the first time in their lives and get to secure and you know, oversee a secure and stable election so that they could adopt their constitution that secured their democratic process and their freedom was a real experience for me. We also screened the Syrian border. So I've seen what a secure border looks like and how important that is to not have bad guys bring in humans or weapons from one country into another. Uh, and we also were, my platoon was selected to participate in the largest offensive operation of 2005, uh, Operation Restore Rights, the city of Talafar, Iraq. And if you've ever read uh, either the books, Book of Kings, it's referred to as Talasar in the Old Testament. But that city still exists. It's Talafar, Iraq now. And in 2005, it had been completely overrun by insurgents. The Iraqis were uh, completely uh, under the totalitarian, totalitarian control of the insurgents there in the city. Several Americans had been killed. And so we built an earthen berm around the city, and my platoon was, we evacuated civilians for two weeks, and then my platoon was selected to help clear the city of insurgents. So we fought city block by city block into the middle of town. It took about 30 days. Uh, but again, you learn a lot about yourself when you're in those kinds of situations. And when you see uh, people who can't leave their home for risk of being killed, and these are innocent civilians with families and children, <laughs> And then we come in and take the bad guys out. And I remember we would, at the end of the operation, we would kind of roll into these neighborhoods and we would 
we would have our vehicles, but we would also be on foot patrol, and uh, it was a, a different town. All of a sudden, people were coming out of the streets, and they would bring tea and, and, and pastries and treats for us. We would hand out candy to the kids, and it was like kind of what you see at the end of World War II when American soldiers would liberate French villages, and the French would come out and celebrate. And you saw that in the eyes of some of these Iraqis who had been under this totalitarian insurgent control for too long and their lives were, were threatened and they didn't have basic necessities because they didn't have any freedom and there, there was a spontaneous celebration of the freedom that, that uh, we had assisted in providing by eliminating that insurgent threat. And you know, you go through experiences like that and you learn to value the freedoms we have here in the United States of America at, on a different level. So I came home from that deployment. They moved my unit to Fort Hood, Texas. We drew all new equipment, trained up for a year, went right back to Iraq as part of the surge. Second deployment was 15 months long, two Thanksgivings, two Christmases. Uh, and I tell you, by the end of that, I was kind of tired of being in Iraq. And so we came home to the United States. I got out of the Army. I moved to the city of St. Louis. And I worked as an armed guard at a courthouse in inner city St. Louis at the corner of Van Deventer and Del Mar, if we've got anybody from St. Louis in the, in the, in the crowd. Uh, so I went from commanding 13 platoons in Iraq to wearing a revolver working at the front door of the courthouse. Went back to Mizzou Law School on the post-9-11 GI Bill. So paid for paid for my school in blood, sweat, and tears. It was a privilege to get to do that. All I ever wanted to do was be a prosecuting attorney. My grandfather had worked in law enforcement, and he used to take me to court with him to watch him testify. And I thought working with the police to lock bad guys up uh, was about the coolest job. So that's what I wanted to do. And so I really geared my studies towards that. And I actually interned with an alumni of Hannibal LaGrange. He was on the baseball team here at Hannibal LaGrange. His name's Nathan K. Rose. He was the, uh, he was the uh, county prosecutor in Montgomery County. And he and I were friends. We'd gone to law school together. I got to intern with him and uh, help him out. And then now he's on the bench in Montgomery County. We're still friends. He's a judge now. But uh, got to be a prosecuting attorney. I started at the attorney general's office. And the attorney general's office does special prosecution all over the state of Missouri. I actually had a case uh, in Hannibal. A uh, long time ago, it was just on a sentencing hearing. But I've had cases all over the state of Missouri. Got to try numerous jury, jury trials. I had married a gal from Texas that I met when I was in the Army down there. She was tired of me being in Nottoway County one night and then uh, Dunklin County the next day kind of wanted me home at night. So I took a job in, in Warren County as an assistant prosecutor. We settled down there. Herman's been the closest town to where we live for the, since 2014. So we lived in southwest Warren County, and Herman was kind of where – that's where we go to church, where my kids go to school. And as was mentioned, you know, when you're in a third-class county as a prosecutor, uh, you have a couple different jobs. I was also the attorney for the county juvenile office. I was standing in court one day, and there was a kid begging the judge to terminate his parents' parental rights so he would have a home to go to for Christmas. Just about killed me. I told my wife, like, hey, did you know there were kids that didn't have homes to go to for Christmas? Well, no, we didn't know that. So we became foster parents. Uh, we've adopted three kiddos out of the foster system. We've recently had a biological child as well. So it's kind of a soft cover two zone defense that we're running on them. Kind of a bend, don't break, keep everything in front of you when you got four kids and there's only two parents. But getting to be a dad is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, so my oldest two kiddos, we met them when they were three and two. And the children's division introduced us into Burger King. So my kids think that children come from Burger King. <laughs> so after we'd adopted them and uh, they went down to Texas to visit their grandparents, my in-laws, all of a sudden, and by the way, when you, when you go from not being a parent to two kids overnight and they're three and two, they're potty trained to talk. I thought kids just come to you potty trained to talk. I didn't know there was a solar set. So they went down to Texas to visit their grandparents. The children's division puts a baby in our house. All of a sudden, I'm driving to, to uh, the, the Warrens at Walmart at, at 2 a.m. to get bottles and diapers and all the things. Most people accumulate over a nine-month period in preparation for having a baby. And I'm learning how to change diapers you know, at, at 4 a.m. When there's, when there's a mess. Um, but my oldest two come back in the, come back from their, their vacation and walk in the house and see a baby there and say, well, you went to Burger King without us? <laughs> so most recently, my wife uh, gave birth to our biological son. He'll be two in May. But a couple of years ago, when my wife was pregnant, we had some really tough conversations about what, where babies come from and what role Burger King may or may not play in that process. <laughs> so uh, after I'd adopted kiddos, all of a sudden I was looking at my grocery bill and my insurance bill and every other bill and realized I couldn't afford to be an assistant prosecutor in a third class county. I went to work at the Missouri Department of Corrections on June 1st, 2018. And that's the same day Governor Parson, our current governor, the 57th governor of the state of Missouri, that's the same day he took office. And he came into office without a staff, and, and had, there were bills to sign, and appointments that had to be made on a certain timeline, and a, a budget that he had to sign or veto. 
So he had to build a staff while he was doing all of those things. And eventually he, he and his staff saw me working at the Department of Corrections and pulled me up to work for him. So I worked for the governor for just about four years, got to make good friends in, in state government and in the General Assembly. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time when our previous Attorney General, Eric Schmidt, was elected to the United States Senate. So I took over on June 3rd, 2023, and we've been firing on all cylinders at the AG's office since then. And I think if anybody's followed the work they, they, that we've done, you can see the value that I place on freedom, safety, and prosperity. And all of those things work together. And our Constitution maximizes our opportunity to experience those three things. And our forefathers, our parents, our grandparents, they protected those three principles and hand that legacy off to us. And it's the question today is, are we going to be stewards of that legacy and hand it off to the next generation? Or are we going to squander it? Because you can't sit on the sidelines and watch this country slouch toward authoritarian Sodom and Gomorrah. You've got to be active. You've got to take a stand. You've got to fight. If you care about your freedom, you care about safety, you care about prosperity, you've got to be willing to stand up and, and, and do something about it. Uh, so let's talk about the Constitution briefly. And I know I, I heard everybody was here today because midterms are next week and everybody wanted to get out of studying for midterms. <laughs> so I was encouraged to you know, talk as long as I could about the Constitution and law and get really wonky on uh, some educational stuff just to, uh, to, to help you guys out for midterms. I promise I won't do that. The Constitution was written by our founding fathers. And they took with them the experience they had in England, where there was a monarch. The king could tell them what they could and couldn't do. And there was a parliament in England, but that parliament was somewhat beholden, uh, shared authority with the king. The king had most of the authority, and parliament had some authority. But even the parliament was made up primarily of wealthy landowners. So not, not exactly a democratically representative government. But our founding fathers studied ancient Greek and Roman history, and certainly had, had their experience from England that they brought with them to the constitutional conventions where they ended up drafting and ratifying, assisting with the ratification of the United States Constitution. But that Constitution is designed to maximize liberty and, you know, as a, as a basic irreducible axiomatic principle, with liberty comes individual responsibility. You have the right to vote. It is your responsibility to get up on election day and go cast that ballot and be educated about who you're voting for. You have the right to keep and bear arms. You have the responsibility not to leave a loaded gun where a two-year-old can get to it. See how that works? The liberty also carries personal individual responsibility, and that's a good thing because that makes us who we are. Uh, but the Founding Fathers, let, let's talk about a few of the amendments. And so you've got articles of the Constitution that design the structure of our government. And we have a democratic republic. So the capricious whims of the majority, as represented by the democratic process, are tempered through a Republican, little r, Republican structure. And we also have a shared system of federalism, where the federal government has some authority, and then the state governments have the remainder of the authority. And that's good, because again, when you diffuse power over three branches of government in a democratic republic with a system of federalism, you diffuse that power it is impossible, theoretically, for one person to take all the power and be in charge all the time. That's a good thing. That separation of powers, that diffusion of power, maximizes our liberty. The structure of our government matters because the whole purpose of the government, or excuse me, the, the, the structure of government matters. The whole purpose of the Constitution is to protect us from the government. And those structural mechanisms that are codified in the Constitution do that. So that's the article of the Constitution. But then, as soon as the Constitution was drafted and ratified by the states, by the colonies at the time, later became states, uh, Congress realized, well, we need some individual guarantees of individual liberty. And so they passed the Bill of Rights, uh, Amendments 1 through 10. First Amendment contains the right to free press, right to free speech, and the right to free exercise of religion. And it prohibits Congress from enacting a national religion. Second Amendment includes the right to keep and bear arms and the right of the states to form militias as a structural mechanism against a strong, uh, over-energetic federal central authority. So those are a couple of the amendments I want to talk about briefly. 
Again, this, these structural mechanisms maximize our freedoms. But those freedoms are under attack. The structure of our government is under attack. So what we have now is not only do we have an executive branch that includes President Biden, but we have and, and a, a legislative branch that includes the Congress, and a judicial branch that's all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. But now we have this kind of unauthorized fourth branch of government, the bureaucratic state. Anybody ever heard of the EPA, or the Department of Energy, or the, the Department of Agriculture? All of these, this alphabet soup of uh, the Department of Justice, this alphabet soup of federal agencies, those individuals aren't elected. And yet they have rulemaking authority that controls what we can and can't do in our lives. That was never envisioned. That fourth branch of government was never envisioned by the founders. And it, to the extent that they saw that coming, they would have referred to it as kind of a soft despotism. And so what I see today are several of our liberties, some of these foundational principles, the structure of our government under attack by federal bureaucratic agencies that are exceeding the scope of their authority. And that interferes with what we, we can and can't do in our individual lives and what the state can and can't do. So let me give you an example. We've got pending right now one of the most important First Amendment suits in this nation's history. The right to free speech is central to who we are as a people. Our founders dealt with a king in England who could stop a print. He handed out the license to, to have a printing press. You couldn't print anything and distribute it to the public without the king giving you permission. And the king could tell you no you can't print something before you printed it. It's called prior restraint. So the king controlled the speech in England because the king doesn't want anybody talking bad about him. But in America, our founding fathers understood that in the, on the battlefield of ideas, the best ideas will win. So we shouldn't shy away from dissent. We shouldn't run from public discourse. We should have a free, fair, and open marketplace of ideas where we can debate and the best ideas will carry the day and everyone will be We'll, we'll live with the consequences thereof. So government censorship is illegal in America because of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. But after President Biden took office, we started noticing that on big tech social media platforms, who, who here has uh, social media? Everybody communicates on social media today. In a lot of ways, that is now, that marketplace of ideas, it exists on social media. It used to exist in the, in the public forum, in the town hall, then it was on television, then it was on radio, then it was on, on, the, on phone lines. Now it's on big tech social media platforms. That's where so many of us get our information and, and, and debate topics. But after President Biden took office, suddenly certain viewpoints were being removed from big tech social media platforms. We filed a lawsuit here in the state of Missouri against the federal government and uncovered through the discovery process that so many of those viewpoints were being censored at the demand of, federal, at the, of the federal government. The censorship algorithms that were booting certain people off of big tech or censoring certain voices, those censorship algorithms were manipulated to satisfy the demands of federal officials. So that violates the First Amendment right to free speech. And it's not just your right to say what you want. It's the right of everyone to listen. The First Amendment covers not only the speaker, but the listeners as well. So in my estimation, we have got to build a wall of separation between tech and state to protect our First Amendment right to free speech. The big tech marketplace is different because there's a federal law, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, that essentially makes it a, a, a government-controlled, government-sanctioned monopoly. So it, it operates differently. But if we build that wall of separation between tech and state, we can protect our right to say and hear what we please. We went to court back in May of 2023, put on evidence, and on the 4th of July, the district court handed down and laid the first brick in that wall of separation between tech and state by handing down a nationwide injunction to prevent federal censorship on big tech social media platforms to protect all of our right to free speech. Uh, the case is Missouri v. Biden. I'm very proud of it. Um, the federal government didn't like that. They wanted to be able to censor speech on big tech. So they appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We successfully defended the nationwide injunction twice. So the score is Missouri 3, Biden 0 in the fight for free speech. And we're going to the Super Bowl. We'll be at the United States Supreme Court on March 18th. And I'll be sitting at council table as we argue this case to, to keep building that wall of separation between tech and state. Now, here's the federal government's argument. Let's think about this from a biblical context for a second. The federal government says, listen, it's not censorship. The federal government has a responsibility to protect the public from lies, from untruths. Well, why do they get to decide what is and isn't true? Who gave them that authority? And what if suddenly, and I guarantee this is true, 
I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. But I guarantee you there are people that work in the federal government that don't view the Bible that way. So what if all of a sudden these federal officials say, the Bible is a lie, you can't, we're not going to talk about Bible verses or have any kind of worship or evangelism on big tech social media. Would any of us tolerate that? If we don't make the stand now, we will slouch toward authoritarianism and we will lose our freedom of speech. And it starts with talking about things like COVID tyranny or election integrity or President Trump. That's what was censored previously. But I guarantee you biblical truth is not too far down the list of topics that some of these federal officials would want to censor. So that's what's at stake. I am confident in our ultimate victory at the United States Court of Appeals, and we're going to bring home a win to the people of the state of Missouri and anyone who appreciates our constitutional freedoms in the United States of America. We're going to do that in March. We'll probably get a decision in June, so stay tuned on that one. hundred years from now, kids in law school will crack open a constitutional law textbook and read the case of Missouri v. Biden and think about the stand we took at this place, at this time, for freedom. Uh, so many other times. Second Amendment. Why do we have the Second Amendment? So there were several kings in England that would disarm different groups of people because the king didn't want anyone standing up against the king's authority. And so the founding fathers understood that a, a well-armed citizenry was essential to preventing an over-energetic centralized authority. So the court has interpreted the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms as applying not only to the community but to individuals. So we have the right as a state to have a militia, the Missouri National Guard, but you as an individual, if you're of appropriate age, have the right to keep and bear arms to defend you, your family, and your property. There are certain ways that the federal government has attacked that. So right now the federal government is trying to pass certain rules that would limit or curtail your right to keep and bear arms. Uh, we filed lawsuits against those to try to stop that. That's how, in a system of federalism, the state can fight back uh, through using the court process to prohibit those kinds of infringements on our personal liberty. Uh, there's a, a case pending right now at the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. So the Missouri General Assembly passed what's known as the Second Amendment <coughs> Preservation Act. And what it says is that the federal government can't commandeer the apparatus of the state to achieve unconstitutional objectives. Well, it's kind of like the free speech case. Why does the federal government want to suppress speech so badly in violation of the Constitution anyway? In this instance, why would, the, why would the federal government want to tell the officials in the state of Missouri to do things that are unconstitutional? So the, the General Assembly passed the Second Amendment Preservation Act, and it's as much about the Second Amendment, Amendment as it is about the Tenth Amendment. So Tenth Amendment says that any authority not explicitly given to the federal government or de deprived to the states is enjoyed by the states and the people of the states. In other words, if the Constitution doesn't say the state can't do it and doesn't say the federal government can do it, then the state can do it. And that's been interpreted to mean that the federal government can't force the states to do certain things. That's up to the states to decide. So the Second Amendment Preservation Act doesn't limit the federal government at all. It limits the state and says, we're not going to let the federal government boss us into doing unconstitutional things. Well, the Department of Justice sued the state of Missouri over that. Sued us. They don't like that. They want to be able to tell us what to do. Even though that's not in their purview in, uh, under our constitutional structure. And so the risk is, again that the states will cease to have any meaning at all if the federal government is now in charge of the entire operational apparatus of, of the state and of state government. So the, the Second Amendment Preservation Act is as much a codification of the Tenth Amendment anti-commandeering doctrine as it is a protection of our right to keep and bear arms. And the Department of Justice has sued us on that. We're defending that, that case in court right now. Under Article Three of the United States Constitution, to get into federal court, a plaintiff, the person bringing the lawsuit, has to show a concrete injury in fact from an illegal act. Well, the federal government hasn't been injured. The Second Amendment Preservation Act doesn't limit the federal government. So there's no the federal court should have no jurisdiction over that matter because they can't demonstrate that they, the Department of Justice can't demonstrate that they're actually harmed. They may not like what the law says, but they haven't been harmed, thus their suit is improper. And essentially, that's the argument we've made in court. But that's some of the ways that the Attorney General's office we're fighting to protect our freedom. Let me tell you about one other case that I think may interest you. So, the right to a trial by jury exists in the United States Constitution. But it's not only an individual right. If you're accused of a crime, you have the right to have a jury of your peers to determine whether or not you committed that crime. But it's also a right of the community 
as citizens, we have the right to have a say in our judicial processes by being on juries. And so there was a case recently, it was out of Buchanan County, Missouri. It was an employment discrimination case where a, a, a homosexual woman said, I've been discriminated against at, at the workplace. So she brought suit. So the judge brings in 50, 60 people who are potential jurors, and then the attorneys go through and question those 50, 60 people and get to the 12 people who actually serve on the jury. Well, the attorneys started asking questions like, well, are you a Christian? As a Christian, do you think homosexuality is a sin? And there were Christians on the jury pool in that group of 50 or 60 who said, well, I am a Christian, but I also am going to follow the law of the state of Missouri and just apply whatever law the state, the, 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 that exists in the jury instructions that the judge will ultimately give us. But the judge said, those Christians can be on this jury and be fair to this homosexual. So those, those Christians were denied the ability to serve on the jury because of their religious beliefs. That's not how our country is supposed to work. We cannot allow these types of anti-discrimination laws to relegate Christians to second-class citizen status. So my office appealed and went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and we just got a decision a few weeks ago, and Justice Alito latched on to the exact point I'm making here and said, this should not be happening this way. You cannot deny people of religious belief, of faith the ability to serve on jurors, juries just because of their religious beliefs, especially when they're on record saying, we're going to apply the law as written. So we got the court's attention, but that's something that's an issue we have to remain vigilant on uh, in, the, in the coming days, weeks, and months, and years, because those types of principles, we will lose our free exercise of religion if we don't have the state attorney general's office focused on defending those, those freedoms that are codified in the United States Constitution. So I was supposed to talk about a free society. I did my best. I did my best to show you guys some of the examples of how if our, the structure of our government our founding legal document, the United States Constitution, protect a free society, and what's at risk if we let it go? But I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Yes, sir. Speak just for a moment of the lawsuit filed yesterday versus Planned Parenthood. Absolutely, yeah. So there are law. So Planned Parenthood. So the Dobbs decision came down and said that it's up to the states to decide whether abortion is legal or illegal. And let me say this: all life has value. Uh, you know. So when my wife and I adopted our oldest kiddos, shortly after they were placed in our home, we found out my wife was pregnant. And so you can imagine kind of the, the stress of learning to be a parent and all of a sudden having two kids and a pregnant wife. And, and so we got my kids uh, on August 1st, 2016. And by October, at the first ultrasound, the doctor told us uh, our biological child would not survive. And so in, on June 3rd of 2017, uh, uh, my wife gave birth to a daughter I got to hold, we named her Grace, because by the grace of God, I got to hold her for an hour before she passed away. And I wouldn't trade the hour I, I got to spend with my daughter for anything on earth, and that's how I know every life has value. So I am adamantly pro-life because we're made in the image of God and shouldn't be destroying that life. Missouri and the General Assembly agrees with me because they passed what's called the heartbeat bill to protect the unborn in the state of Missouri. So when the Dobbs decision came down and that issue was handed back to the states, which is probably where it should have been from the beginning, we had a trigger law in effect. And I remember uh, talking to the governor and him signing the executive order that put that trigger law in effect. And I personally walked that down to Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft's office and handed it to him. I have a great picture of me and, and Jay Ashcroft holding that executive order that put that trigger law in effect. But it, that trigger law is designed to protect human life. Uh, so Planned Parenthood is not allowed to perform abortions in the state of Missouri. They're no longer allowed to destroy human life in the boundaries of our state. But in November of 2023, a video came out that where a, a clinic, a Planned Parenthood clinic in Kansas City, was ready, willing, and able to traffic young girls across state lines for the purpose of obtaining abortion, and we're going to do it without any parental consent or abiding by any of the statutes that require risk notifications about how dangerous these processes are. And the worst part about it is the young girl in the video, this investigative video, comes into the clinic and says, I'm 13 and pregnant. And you've got a clinician smiling, grinning, giddy at the opportunity to help her destroy human life. 13-year-olds can't consent to sexual conduct in the state of Missouri. So that's a sexual offense committed against a minor, and the clinic was willing to conceal that, that, that sexual offense. Conceal the sexual exploitation of a minor. The clinic was a mandatory reporter and had the obligation to report to law enforcement that a crime had been committed. 
but they are so committed to the destruction of human life, they're willing to break our laws and put the health and safety of women and children at risk to do it. This is not an isolated incident. Let's go back to 2018 when I, my predecessor, Josh Hawley, as Attorney General, uncovered the fact that a clinic in Columbia, Missouri, was using a moldy abortion machine on women, and re doctors were refusing to fill out the necessary paperwork when there were complications. This isn't a machine that just forgot to be cleaned and sat in the corner. This is a machine they were using to destroy human life. So when I say they're committed to the destruction of human life and willing to put the, the health and safety of women at risk, that's what I'm talking about. Let's flash forward to 2019, 2020, when my predecessor, Eric Schmidt, was Attorney General. And in testimony, he uncovered that physicians were refusing to provide the statutorily required risk notification to women about how dangerous these procedures were. This is a, Planned Parenthood has committed themselves to refusing to comply with Missouri law. In no other context would we allow an organization to operate in the state of Missouri with this kind of brazen and willful violations of our state statute. So yesterday we filed suit and we're going to push that forward and we intend to fight it out on this line as long as it takes. Because we should not allow this kind of organization that is destroying human life, harming people, and violating our state laws to continue to operate in the state of Missouri. Subjective. Well, since when is objective reality subject? 
It's unhealthy to deny objective reality. I may not like the law of gravity. I can not like the law of gravity all I want in my mind, subjectively. But if I jump into the Grand Canyon, it's unhealthy. <laughs> the same is true with gender. It is unhealthy to deny uh, God's objective reality. And I think Riley, you know, would, would agree with me on that point. I think that's what she's been fighting for. And so we've been proud to partner with her. You know, we've had so many different uh, issues we've addressed here in the state of Missouri. Uh, in February of 2023, so imagine I've been on, on the job for less than 45 days, and I get a whistleblower that came forward from a clinic in St. Louis, a pediatric transgender clinic, that made allegations that, if true, amount to nothing short of child abuse, that kids were being funneled into a gender muti mutilation system with zero psychological or psychiatric help. They come into this clinic with gender dysphoria. They're confused about their gender. And 75% of them, apparently, learned about their gender on TikTok. So rather than talking to these kids and saying, let's talk about human biology. Let's talk about the role that men and women play. And what are you confused about? Rather than talking to them and using just normal mental health services, they're raced into this uh, assembly line where they're given puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, of which the FDA has not approved for the treatment of gender dysphoria. There's no study to say that these dangerous, powerful pills that forever alter the human body are safe or effective for use in treating this mental disorder. And some of the children were even referred for permanent irreversible surgeries where they'll never be able to enjoy the full spectrum of adulthood. And the adults in the room were coerced into assisting in making these decisions under false pretenses. Those are the allegations that the whistleblower made. So, I demanded that the clinic cease operations until we could conduct an investigation and look into it. We launched the first of its kind investigation in the, this nation's history. The clinic declined, said, well, we can't do a moratorium because we're the only clinic providing these services in the state of Missouri. That wasn't true. Subsequent investigation revealed there was a shadowy and clandestine network of these clinics mutilating children across the state of Missouri. And the number of referrals of children for this gender mutilation was steadily increasing. So I worked with my partners in the General Assembly, like Senator Laughlin, and said, hey, we're going to promulgate an emergency rule to put some safeguards on this in the short term and give you all a chance to enact a statute that adopts the policy position that expresses the will of the people's elected representatives. And we fought this process in court. The General Assembly passed a great bill, Senate Bill 49. Governor Parson signed it into law, and it ended these gender mutilation processes for children in the state of Missouri. So instantly, the ACLU sued and said, well, this is unconstitutional. You can't have that kind of law. I defended it in court. And over a three-day trial, we cross-examined their experts and got them to admit that they didn't have any science or medicine backing up these procedures, that they were denying kids access to mental health services, that they were ignoring the science coming out of Europe saying that these processes are dangerous. We put on the whistleblower that came forward with the affidavit. She was willing to submit to cross-examination in, in open court and testify to what she had seen in her personal experience. And then we put on detransitioners. People who were minors and had undergone these surgeries, these pills, that are now testifying about how their life has forever changed and they'll never get to enjoy the full spectrum of adulthood because the adults that were in the room that should have been protecting them failed. And we won. We are the first state in the nation to successfully defend that kind of statute at the trial court level. And I'm so proud of the work Missouri has done to protect kids.